So this one's going to be focusing on one of the domain APIs of Google TV that I think um, kind of ties in really nicely to the companion app um, stuff that I was talking about during the Q&A. Um, so whenever you kind of think of people watching TV, you, you kind of think of someone like Mr. Leanback here. Um, Paul Saxman kind of came up with Mr. Leanback, and I really like him, so he's come back again. Um, Mr. Leanback is someone who's got his favorite drink, he's got the remote, he's, he's at about 45 degree angle, any more than that, and you're actually sleeping. Um, but the way we kind of phrase this is, is you're kind of in that leanback mode, you're not wanting to do anything, you're just chilling out and you're just consuming content. Um, but when you actually look at statistics, um, most people are fiddling with their laptops or their phones or a tablet. They've got something else that they're doing while they're watching TV. They're, most people don't just sit there and just essentially lean, sit in the lean back mode. So then you kind of come to someone like this, Miss Multiscreen. Um, and she's sat there. She's got her snacks to keep her going. She's got a laptop. She's got a phone. She's got a remote. Now, admittedly, this is the other end of the spectrum, someone who's literally just got everything going on at once and this is a bit too far the other way um, because again when you start looking at more statistics um, most people most households they've only got a couple of these devices per household they're not you can't imagine they're getting consumed all at once by one person but like I said most people they are playing around with something while they're watching TV so this is a bit more of a familiar setting. There's a couple of people that are sitting there, they're watching TV. One or two of them are mucking around with a phone or a tablet or something. And the interesting thing with this is you're getting to a point where now they want to do more than just watch TV. And this is kind of the interesting intersection, especially with Android and with Google TV, where you can just start targeting the phones towards what they're doing on the TV and vice versa. People want to do more than just watch TV. I can't stress that point enough. And a couple of apps that are particularly great kind of companion app or second screen apps that are out there. So Able Remote is a really interesting one because they took um, the open source um, Google Remote, Google TV Remote, and then started adding in their own features. They saw stuff that wasn't there and they wanted to improve it. So you can add your favorite channels. Um, my favorite feature is adding apps and then when you want to essentially launch one of them, you just do it from your phone and then up it comes on the TV. Um, and then obviously they've got a Google Music widget, which means you're controlling Google Music on the TV rather than your phone. The Spill, the Pill Smart rem Remote app. Um, these are really interesting. These guys basically didn't want to give you a reason to, to leave their app. They didn't want you to start going out and exploring other stuff on your tablet um, just so then you can change the remote or change the um, channel. So they actually built the remote into their app. And the main purpose of this is it's changing the way you're watching content. It's telling you what's on or giving you other options of other stuff you might be interested in. Um, and then you can do it right there from the app. Trivialist. These guys, their aim is to get a Google TV in every sports bar. Um, and then basically people start walking in the bar, they chime in and connect, and then they start answering questions. And then you can start battling between friends, other people in the bar, um, I personally would really like it if you could start getting sort of bars against bars, getting to that level. But again, it's a nice idea where people are just literally coming in in this social setting, checking in and checking out, just doing some fun stuff. And Movil, they're another kind of interesting um, group because they're actually building up their own APIs because these guys have been doing a lot of stuff in the smart TV business. Um, they've essentially built up their own framework which allows you to start connecting between multiple smart TVs, multiple devices. It doesn't have to be on the same network. You can start going over 3G and 4G. And yeah, they've started developing their own apps to demonstrate their own APIs. So here we've got like the poker app where people start playing against it. And the interesting thing with this is you've not only got Android, but you've got JavaScript APIs. Um, so it's interesting to see how people are starting to play around with this stuff, making it so that everyone can start accessing them. So on Google TV, we have the um, Anymote protocol. Now, this is what we're using to um, essentially create second screen applications. Um, so that's what the Able Remote is using. Um, the main aim of this is to essentially have a standard way of 
connecting to a Google TV, so discovering it, pairing between it, and then also start securely sending messages. Um, so the main aim with any moat is you can start sending key presses, you can start sending cursor movements, um, as well as start firing off intents. So the way it works is the discovery is done by um, multicast DNS. So the Google TV has an AnyMote service that's just sitting there listening for these broadcasts. As soon as it gets it, it pings back, letting you know that it's actually it's there and it, these are the services that it supports. And the minute you see the AnyMote service, that's when you know that the device has found a Google TV. Um, authentication and pairing is done by a set of messages to confirm what essential challenges that the device can handle, what responses the TV can take. And then from that point, you just have essentially a challenge that needs to be solved um, by a person entering it in. Um, and then after that, you're set to securely send messages between the device and the TV. So one of the biggest issues that we had with this when we first kind of announced it is we did a number of events and a number of hackathons, and a lot of people were kind of along the lines of, look, I tried doing this, and I sunk all my time into this, and I didn't actually get anything done. And I went off and did something else in the last kind of couple of hours of the hackathon because I just gave up. So we came up with an AnyMote library, which is basically the entire sole purpose of this is to simplify everything um, for developers. So the way this works is you've got a number of things that you just need to implement. So you've got a client listener, which your activity listens to, which basically will get callbacks throughout the life cycle of the service. You've got a connection that you need to set up with the AnyMote service, so that way you actually get um, the AnyMote message protocol, etc. Um, and then there's some other bits as well, but I'm going to go through all of them now. So, so this is the AnyMote client listener. Literally, these are the kind of things you'd expect from a service, so connected, disconnected, and on-connection error. And the main purpose of this is you just need to make sure you keep a hold of the AnyMote sender. That's what you're going to use to send messages and send intents. Um, and then on the disconnected and the error, just null it and just handle the error so the user knows what's going on. Um, the service connection, um, as you can see, it looks pretty much standard to what you use for an ordinary service. The main key line um, is essentially that one there, attach client listener. So you pass in your activity since that's the client listener in this case. Um, and that's essentially it. After that, the AnyMote library will start taking care of the connection and everything else for you and just let you know when it's connected, when it's disconnected. And then when you actually get to the point where you want to do the pairing process, um, you fire off this intent. So essentially what you're doing there is actually launching the service on the client. Um, and this will start the pairing process. Um, you, we've done it in OnCreate. You don't need to do it in OnCreate. You can do it whenever you want. So when they actually say, look, I've got a Google TV, hit that button, then you can start the pairing process. So once you've done that, this is where the fun bit starts happening. You start getting to the point where you say, okay, cool, I'm going to start sending these key presses. So key presses, you can send any of the standard key events from Android, and they'll be interpreted by the system. Now what this means is, your app on the TV doesn't need to be in the foreground. You can start sending key presses to other apps, essentially, because what you're doing is you're communicating with the Google TV rather than an app. And it's exactly the same with a touch handler. So with this, what you're actually doing is you're sending some view. Now what this means is in your UI, you don't need to have a specific view. You don't need to inherit from a certain view. You literally pass it any old view, and it will turn it into a trackpad within your own app. And then, obviously, you've got the generic sending intents. So the common use case for this is if you have a companion app on the Google TV that you're, you specifically want to use with your remote, all you have to do is just send an intent and launch your activity on the Google TV as soon as you've connected. So what that means is you've paired with the TV, you send off the intent, and then you've got both apps open at once. So here's the... Um, URL to go and grab it. There's an example of a blackjack remote game as well, um, as well as the actual library that you need to use. Um, so yeah, and it's bundled with a load of other stuff as well, so definitely go check that out. Um, and I've included this slide right at the very end. It does sum up everything that's going on, but if for whatever reason you didn't like the library, um, you just wanted to use, say, the discovery element of it, 
Um, Google TV, because it's using MDMS, you can use JMDMS, JMDNS. And what you do for that is you just listen for the Anymote um, service from the Google TV. And then that way, you get the IP address, the port number, and the name from the Google TV. Um, the pairing protocol, that's completely separate as well. Um, and that's the bit that will actually overlay some UI in your app. You don't like the UI? Go in and customize it. Um, and yeah, any map protocol reference. So all that's doing is using protobuffer, which is agnostic to platform. So if you wanted to start using it in iOS and stuff like that, you can do that. It's a standard um, protocol. So you're free to do whatever you want with it. Um, and I've included the, this because it was a number of talks that we gave at I.O. And I don't want to spend too much time focusing on it because it's really heavily geared towards content providers. But if you ever start looking into this and you say, actually, I, I need to do this, um, it, I need to make you guys aware of it. Um, because one way or another, it's the sort of thing that is really, really useful. Um, so we're adding in new APIs, which allows you to have um, a custom streaming protocol as well as custom DRM solutions. So Christian, Andrew, and Mark, I, was always, I already mentioned their talk from Google I.O. And they go into really in-depth detail about this. But essentially, you don't need to write native code to write your own streaming protocol, which has kind of been the done thing for Android. Um, we allow you to basically have hooks into quite a lot of the low-level stuff so you can actually st stay in the Java layer and write your own streaming protocol and DRM solution. And an example of this is SiriusXM. So they're a online radio company. And they have their own streaming solution. They were just like, look, if we haven't got NDK, then we can't, can't really start even thinking about your platform. And so these guys were one of the first um, set that actually started helping us develop this API. And, and yeah, it, it's a good API, and it works exactly like they want. And we've had a couple of people using it. And they've helped us work out where we haven't actually been able to give them what they need. Um, on top of that, we've got quality of service APIs. So what this is, is essentially if you imagine someone like Netflix or Amazon or Google Play, at the moment on Android, if a video fails, it'll either not tell you, or it'll just fail and then just go, that's it, I'm done. Wrong state. And that's all you kind of get. What we're trying to do is move to a point where if you're getting a really rubbish experience from the media player, like it's just sitting there buffering, so it'll play five seconds of video, buffer for five seconds, that's not good. Netflix and Amazon, they don't... Can they really charge you if you're getting that sort of an experience? So what we're trying to do is introduce a load of APIs that enables them to say, well, look, this is the bit rate we're on, this is the bandwidth we're getting. Yeah, it's not really good enough. Um, we're going to give you your money back, or you can try again. What do you want to do? So at least then... We're giving content providers the access to basically give the user experience that they want to give. Um, and plus, we announced that we're going to support smooth streaming, which is a variable bitrate video um, streaming protocol, and um, play-ready support as well for DRM, because that's just um, essentially a real big standard in the um, industry. Now, this is probably going to sound really ridiculous, because I'm going to start talking about publishing on Play. Um, but there's one thing that a lot of developers, they, they trip up on when they start publishing in the Play Store, and then they instantly come to us going, look, I've, I've done this, and it's just not in the Play Store. What the hell's going on? I've, I've done everything right. It's not working. And normally it's something really trivial and quite minor. Um, but when it comes to distributing your apps, you're going to be still doing it through Play Store. It's still going to be through the developer console. There's no real difference. There's just some things that you need to do to let Play Store know that it works on Google TV. Um, so one of the main things is if you force your app into a portrait, land, um, or just to stay in portrait mode, it won't work on Google TV. Google TV does not support portrait mode. It is, if though de facto, landscape. Um, so if you say into your activity, just stay in portrait, I'm not sure whether Play will filter that out or not. I think it does. Um, but if it launches, it will crash. Not, not a nice crash either. It makes the whole UI go a bit weird because it's still trying to render it. Um, the other alternative is you say, I use the feature portrait. That's probably the slightly better one because then we'd definitely filter you out because we don't support that feature. 
The worst one is this one. This is a real no-no. Um, if you're going to do it in code, then my suggestion is double-check that you're actually on a device that can support portrait. If it doesn't, then switch over to a landscape or find some nice way of degrading. Um, because otherwise, yeah, like I say, it will just crash instantly. So on the note of features, these are a set of features that we support on Google TV. Um, if you're using other features, then it may be a case that you're not going to turn up because we don't support it. Um, things like Bluetooth. Some TVs do support it, some don't. So you have to be wary of that kind of stuff. If you don't need it, then make sure that you don't require it. And plus, there's also the weird state where if you start asking for permissions, you're almost implicitly saying, by the way, I'm going to have this feature request. So you have to be wary of what you're doing there as well. Um, and a really brief kind of checklist. Make sure you set touch screen required to false. I've had developers time and time again just trip over this. It's the one thing that you have to do regardless because by default it's set to true. And this is kind of the core way that Play just instantly cuts out what apps aren't going to be installable on Google TV. Um, so yeah, just add that into your manifest if you do start targeting it. Um, and if you get to a point where you only want to target Google TV, um, then just add in this feature. So basically what that's saying is, is it's got the Google TV libraries, etc. Um, and then at that point, no other device will be able to install it because they won't have it. And finally, tell us about it. Um, all the DevRel team, like we love hearing what you guys are actually working on and what you're doing. So, yeah, definitely do shout about what you're doing to us because then from that point we can start seeing what's out there. Then we start seeing what we can put forward for featuring, etc. So, yeah, we just love hearing about this kind of stuff. So, yeah, do tell us. And finally, we, we just announced that we're getting the native Play Store. And this has been long, long, long overdue. Um, the main reason is just because we wanted to be able to watch movies and rent movies, and we haven't been able to. It's been a real weird way where you have to go through YouTube. Um, and I'm going to do a real quick plug for YouTube as well. Um, did anyone see the YouTube Player API talk at Google I.O. recorded? OK, so I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, one of the biggest problems that a lot of developers have had when they want to get video content into apps is finding a nice way of doing it. You either embed it, you can't change it, you're done. Um, or otherwise, you essentially have to find some way of streaming it to your app. Um, and obviously, we've got all these streaming protocols that we're adding in, etc. but we've still got YouTube. One way or the other, that's kind of the common way that people share video content on the web. So the YouTube guys have created a YouTube player API, which is a fragment as well as a YouTube view that you can embed within your app and it'll basically just stream whatever YouTube video you take from it. There are separate APIs that you can have that will enable you to do it. It will stream HD content. It will also allow you to show monetized content as well. And basically, it's a really, really simple way of you guys just embedding a video straight into your app. Um, we had a YouTube hackathon where people started doing really crazy stuff with flinging tomatoes onto your worst video. So the first one was like Rebecca Black, Friday, Friday. Um, but yeah, that was an interesting one. But do go and check that out. That should be launched hopefully very, very soon. Um, but just thought I'd do a real quick plug for those guys. But other than that, I, I'm done quite a bit under time, so I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, any questions on any of that lot? Um, will the AnyMode protocol be the future, uh, the protocol used for future evolution of uh, Google TV, like to communicate between devices? And what's the link with uh, Android at home? If there um, is any news on this. So at the moment, AnyMode has got the unique kind of side of it: the fact that you're not having to interact with a specific app; you're interacting with the actual platform. So at the moment, that's the main reason for that. And we're also seeing a lot of people finding the sending the intent is obviously useful for just sharing information between apps. Um, so I think one way or another, any other standard that comes in, um, it's, it's unlikely that they're going to start replacing that functionality. So I think it's always going to have a place. Um, 
regardless of what happens, but I also imagine that we're going to continue developing it further, etc. So I, I can't say. Um, it just depends on what people use, what people like, and obviously if one gets sort of used 10 times more than the other one, then at that point the engineering team will, I guess, start deciding whether they want to deprecate it for other ones or not. So, yeah, whichever standard wins, I suppose. Hi. Yeah. Uh, any plan to support uh, NDK on Google TV? So one of the main reasons for the NDK was when we were first launched, we had the Intel chips there, and we were obviously trying to bring Chrome onto the platform, which led to us having some weird issues with the build chain. Um, but once again, it's, it's kind of one of the top one, top requests that we get for developers. And yeah, we see massive value in getting into platform. So yeah, we are trying desperately to get to a point where we can just open that up. So yeah. Are we all done? Okay, I have a bonus question, and that's very, uh, that's not very precise. I don't know what you can tell about that, but so you're working on the Google TV OS. What is so different from the main trunk? Um, so I think at the moment we've gotten to a point where we've done the customizations that we need to the main trunk to make it work with everything that we want it to work with, but... Um, we are going to slowly move to a point where we're relying less and less on deviation and just relying more and more on just on the straight Android trunk because then as that's moving forward, we can obviously then start trying to stay more up to date. But at the moment, yeah, we're, we're trying to get to a point where we're not really touching it. We're merging more and stuff into the Android framework and working with the ecosystem because, like I say, it means that any community can then start taking the platform and, and doing what they want with it. It's kind of the, the beauty of being open source. Okay, thank you. Okay, Jean, I have another question. Um, do you have some advices for the developers who want to start developing for Google TV? Uh, for example, do you have a website where we can find all the requirements, all the tricks for Google TV development? Yeah, so I did have it up on slides, but yeah, it's developers.google.com forward slash TV, and we've literally got so much stuff, so many contents, examples, resources. Um, yeah, we've got a whole team who are just writing this kind of stuff up and just trying to make it as easy as possible for you guys to do whatever you're trying to do. Um, and yeah, we're constantly looking for feedback. So if you try do, doing something and then you go, actually, this isn't really what I wanted or it wasn't any good or here's a problem, here's an issue, like I say, do come and talk to us, tell us about it, because then that way we're more than happy to start going and investigating and fixing stuff. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. And that's the last question, because we are quite late. <laughs> since, since it's the last question, so a very tricky one, yeah, uh, what is the install base of Google TV? Sorry, say that again? How many Google TV units are out there? Um, I don't actually know. Again, that's a, a biz dev question. Um, I don't really look after it, so I'm afraid, so sorry. Okay, so what's happening now? Well, thank you, everyone, for your time anyway. <laughs>
I guess it would be fantastic if we can start doing a similar sort of thing, but at the moment I'm not aware of anything that's going on like that. Um, so, yeah, I can't really comment. It's not something I, I deal with. But, yeah, personally, I'd love to see it happen. Like, I think it would be great. Yes, uh, another question? Yep. Here. Sorry. Uh, what about uh, DLNA? Do, do you plan to... to um, uh, to integrate this uh, this kind of uh, technology, or you you consider to that uh, third party apps will uh, do the job? Um, I mean, I probably assume that there would be third party apps, but they probably rely on the NDK. So it might be a case that the minute we get support for that, then libraries start opening up, and then obviously a lot of stuff starts opening doors. Basically, when we start getting the NDK, um, at the moment I'm not aware of any plans to support. Um, DLNA or any of the other specs but it makes so much sense for us to support it so no doubt that there is a ticket somewhere raced for that exact issue so um, I'm imagining there's probably a licensing issue more than anything but yeah I'd like to see it happen as well <laughs>